welcome, you beautiful people out there in the dark. Okay, let's see. Last week, I was speaking in West Hollywood. I told them that I was drawing a line in the sand, so I'll just sort of brief draw it here a little bit of this whole new phase that I'm in, a whole new chapter of life. Most of you know that I, uh, who've been coming for the last few months, know that I just moved to San Diego or to, to Palm Springs. And so I see this as a year-long sabbatical of sorts, a retuning, kind of hitting the reset button. And uh, it's a perfect time for doing that. For whatever reason, uh, my years tend to go from, from July and August to July and August. That's just kind of how my cycle uh, of growth works. And I know that because of speaking every August at the Miracle Distribution Center conference. And it always seems like something's just winding down, something is just sort of beginning. And so it's been that experience for me this year, but it also seems like it's, it's a whole lifetime that's winding down and something else is starting. And so we've talked here before also about, you know, I was, for months I kept talking about uh, watching Hoarders while I was cleaning <laughs> and also watching Tiny House, Tiny House Nation, was all this movement of uh, people who are downsizing into. Tiny houses are more or less uh, homes that are about 500 square feet or less, so that's tiny. Uh, and that's a whole movement and of course, I didn't know when I started doing all this that I was getting ready to move. And by that I mean I didn't consciously know that. So our psyche knows things that we don't know. And it so often communicates with us through imagery and through the things that we are interested in at a particular time. So I didn't really know why I was so interested in these things or why all this time when I was watching Hoarders that I was giving away all this stuff that people, there's a place, uh, close to where I live there called Out of the Closet, which is one of those thrift stores where you donate stuff. And I was afraid they were gonna say to me, did someone die? Because I had given away like an entire person's wardrobe and furniture and stuff, uh, and not even knowing that I was getting ready to move. And so uh, I can always kind of look at my journey, the symbolism of what is happening and uh, where are we? And I've been, uh, you know, it's interesting because this journey that I made this morning from Palm Springs to here, I was thinking this morning, I've probably made that trip about 150 times or so because twice before I have lived in Palm Springs and been coming to San Diego once or twice a week to speak. So I've seen that road a lot, like I'm familiar with the road and what's there and what's, what's going on. Um, but when you shift, you see different things the things that were always there that you didn't see before. And that's how you can tell when you've shifted. So one of the things that, uh, and I've called this, you know, I, I name my group kind of based on whatever I feel is the basic theme of what I'm going through at that time and what the people are going through at that time. So some of you may never see you again after today. You might hate me after this. And I would just want to say, I won't miss you because I never miss people. I only focus on who is here. I never focus on who isn't here. So when I say I won't miss you, it doesn't mean I don't like you. It just means I focus on what's present, not what's missing. That's what happiness is. It's when you focus on what is here instead of, oh, that person said they were coming and they didn't come or whatever. I focus on who is here, who did come to the party. And this is a party. This is, I feel like I'm Willy Wonka. I've moved into my Willy Wonka phase of life. Uh, and so for a certain amount of time, I had called uh, my group the Joy Academy. And part of the symbol that I used for quite some time during that was a lighthouse. And I felt really like that was kind of what I was doing, was just standing still and just saying the things that we all already basically know, these metaphysical truths of just shining out what we know and to be reminded of that, and that basically what a lighthouse does, of course, is, is the ships are able to see where to go so they don't crash into the shore and so on and so forth. Um, one of the other things that I talked about for years was making penguin steps. 
And this was really helpful to me and a lot of us about this idea of that small, consistent steps make a huge difference. That it's the things that we do every day that really form our lives, not the things that we do now and then. The things that we do on a consistent daily basis are the things that are the most impactful and powerful in the quality of our lives. So these little penguin steps of, instead of trying to do everything all at once and just change your whole life in one day, but just these little things. We talked about um, Anne Lamott, who wrote Bird by Bird, which was a book on writing, talked about writing a shitty first draft. So we talked about, the, the, what she says in that book is she says, people who want to write a perfect first draft never write a book. That you have to write a shitty first draft. And then you write a shitty second draft. And you keep editing it and editing it and editing it as you go along until it becomes the book that you want it to be. But you have to be willing to do a shitty job. And people hated that too when I was saying that. Because I would talk about, you need to do, take yourself to the gym and do a shitty workout. Right? Because we're always thinking, I have to have a, what's the point of going if you're not going to have a fantastic workout and show up at 110%, which there's no such thing in this culture. We're always showing up at 110%, 120%. There's no freaking such thing. Right? And we talked about Byron Katie, you know, saying, just make friends with mediocrity. You know, and people hated that. How oh, we just press through to find that you could have amazing results in your life if you did embrace the idea of mediocrity. Mediocrity being show up on time doing what you said you would do with a good attitude. That's just average mediocrity. And a lot of people who are always going for excellence don't even show up at mediocrity. <laughs> and the, 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 the image that we used of that that was in my psyche at the time was Tabitha Coffey's TV show which is, uh, it was called Salon Takeover, where she would go in and find these hair salons that were struggling, that were ready to basically close. And all of them were going for excellence, and none of them were even close to mediocrity. But they were all saying, we're a high-end excellence, da, 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 and there were cockroaches, you know, and hair that wasn't cleaned up, and the stylists were drinking while they were cutting hair and not showing up half the time, but we're going for excellence. So she would come in and whip them into shape, but all she whipped them into the shape to was the level of mediocrity. And once they were at the level of mediocrity, they started to thrive. They weren't going for excellence. They were just going for, just do the basic thing you said you would do, and you'll thrive, and they did. So we talked about that. We had the symbolism of all of that, and that was fabulous, and now that's over. <laughs> we're into a new phase, and I'm on this sabbatical in the desert of hitting this reset button, where all of those moves, and this was revealed to me just, just as your psyche does, it starts giving you these images that start interesting you and you start paying attention to them. And what, when I was living in Los Angeles for the last five years, the place that I lived, I also had very small classes and I called it the WeHo Zendo. So over here is people talking about the WeHo Zendo and the WeHo Zendo. So when I moved to this little bungalow, and they call these, I don't know why, they call them bungalows. It's not really a bungalow, but they call them bungalows. So I was in this little bungalow, and I thought, what is this? Because I didn't even know why I moved to Palm Springs. I have no idea. It didn't make any sense, really, to me. But, you know, I just answered the call, hey, I just work here. <laughs> Earth is just a big temp job for all of us. So I just go where I'm sent. The call came, I go, okay, we're going to Palm Springs again. And uh, many of you know that I moved into the exact same apartment that I moved out of five years ago, <laughs> except they had remodeled it and changed all the stuff I didn't like about it. So now it's like perfect. But I'm there going like, now what is this place? What is this all about? And so I went through a couple of different phases and what I realized was that it's a launching pad. That this is the desert launching pad. And so that was with me for a couple of days, but I kept thinking, but I don't really relate to the idea of a rocket. <laughs> like a rocket is so cold and, and clinical, and it's really just leaving the planet to go out into outer space. I don't really relate to that. So it took a couple of days to realize that the imagery that came to me was of hot air balloons. God, now I'm just freaking obsessed out of my mind now with hot air balloons. So of course, 150 trips over from Palm Springs to here, I've never seen a hot air balloon. This morning, 
eight hot air balloons. <laughs> right? Because when you turn on channel four, you will see what's on channel four. That's how that works. <laughs> All the time you're driving through on channel two, you don't see what's on channel four. Even though it's there, it's broadcasting, but you don't see it because you're looking at the other channel. So hot air balloons everywhere. So the difference is this. All of that imagery from before, which was that moving of consciousness, because that's all we're ever doing, is shifting our consciousness. So everything we do is really in an effort to shift our consciousness, to expand it. So all of that symbolism of the lighthouse and the penguin steps and all of these things are lateral moves. They're all still on the horizontal earthbound plane. So their movement and their progress and their journeys, but they're all still within that realm of being in the dense earthbound energy. And the feeling that I had before I even had the image of the hot air balloon was of becoming lighter and lighter, of lightening up of your spirit and your whole energy lightening up, being more buoyant, more free, right? So that's the image of hot air balloon, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That the launching is a lifting off. It's not a exiting, getting the hell out of Earth, right? Like, get out of this plane. It's lifting up above one of the images in A Course in Miracles is about, it talks about above the battleground. That you lit, that when you are lifted up, you see things differently than when you're on just the horizontal lateral plane. That when you lift up, you see everything from a different place. And that is that higher consciousness, the idea that we are moving up in consciousness. So what today is about, what I'm talking about my topic today, is sharing the good news. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason that I've been thinking about this is because this was the mission of Jesus. I'm more Jesus-y than ever. <laughs> Jesus has always been my main man, but I'm more Jesus-y than ever. And the message of Jesus was called the good news. Gospel means good news. But of course, it was interpreted in such a way there was nothing good about it. <laughs> when the organized religion took the gospel, they said, well, the gospel is that Jesus died for your sins so that you can go to heaven. This is in no way good news. <laughs> I want you to think of someone that you really love right now, somebody you really, really love unconditionally with all your heart. Now imagine that someone came in here and said, that person was yesterday crucified for you, for your sake, because you are such a horrible, sinful being <laughs> that you were going to go to hell and burn for eternity. So this person that you love very, very much volunteered to be slaughtered and die a slow, agonizing death publicly. <laughs> but the, but after this person died, a couple days later, they came back from the grave and ascended. So, isn't that great? <laughs> Would you in any way consider that good news? Would you go, awesome? <laughs> no, it's not good news, because that was not what the gospel is. That was not what the good news is. The good news was the message of Jesus, which had many different aspects, but certainly if you just look at the things that he said, there was so much good news that we don't really think about enough, such as the kingdom of heaven is within you. The kingdom of heaven is spread across the earth, and you do not see it. All things are possible for you. You will do greater things than these, right? Over and over and over, just a lot of really good news that gets overlooked. So one of the things that I really want to talk about right now is, and I've become absolutely relentless in 
new thought. I really believe now, after all of these years, and that, that this was the thing that I said last week, the line I'm drawing, I said, is that I will in no way at all ever again apologize for being radically new thought. And radical new thought is based on you create your world, period. That I will never again apologize for the idea of desire and goals because it's a natural divine thing. I will no longer make that big, oh, you should only want the peace of God or you should only want, that's horse shit. It has nothing to do with new thought. It's not what Jesus said, right? In fact, what I really want to talk about today very specifically is this idea of, and this was really when I had required reading, this was one of the main uh, books was the Abraham book, Ask and It Is Given. But this is everywhere. Ask and It Is Given is not just what Abraham says. Ask and It Is Given is biblical. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. It's in A Course in Miracles, too. It says, ask and it is given. It's said over and over and over again. If you, in, in fact, in Scripture, it says, you have not because you ask not. So in New Thought, I assume, and I assume this just because you're a human being, that what you would like is more of what you want and less of what you don't want. <laughs> is it safe for me to assume that about you? Sorry. That you would like more of what you do want and less of what you do not want, right? So the question then is, are you actually asking? Or do you just think you're asking? And Having been someone who's been in business as long as I have, I, and particularly this kind of business and the way that it works, I know how often people think they're asking and they're not asking at all. Not asking at all. Now, I wrote about this on Facebook yesterday, so let me just say this. If you say to your family, you know, I really need some help this weekend, you haven't asked a fucking thing. <laughs> Not a thing. You might as well just keep your mouth shut because you haven't asked anything. Now, a lot of people think they asked. Then they wonder why no one helps them. Then they take the victim stance. No one ever lifts a finger to help me. I do everything around here myself. I just ask and have nobody, but that's just me. It's all I ever do is work, work, work around here. And I'm finally having fun. You have not because you ask not. One of the things, you know, if you go to my website, it says it explains in minute details. But of course, people don't read directions because then they would succeed in life. <laughs> so <laughs> so in, minute, in minute detail, it says if you would like a recording, of my latest lecture, and it ha it's my latest lecture. I don't keep them past one week. You have seven days to get whatever the lecture is, and after that, the master is sent out and it is never available again. That's number one. So you can't ask for last month's lecture. It's gone forever. You can do it by PayPal. You can do it by check. You have to then tell me, do you want an MP3 that's a downloadable thing, or do you want a CD? If you want a CD, then you have to give me a mailing address. I cannot tell you how many times people just send something through PayPal and they don't say anything. I'm like, thanks for the money, sucker. <laughs> right? Or they'll say, I want a CD, but they don't provide a mailing address. Oh, great, I'm gonna make a CD and just throw it up into the air. <laughs> Let the cosmos deliver it to you, right? I can't go by your PayPal address on there because people move and never change their PayPal address, right? And last week when I was talking, I ta last week's talk was about, which I think is really a huge aspect of New Thought, which is getting more out of life. And so we talked about how to get more out of life, and the way you get more out of life is by putting more into life. And so we talk specifically about that a lot. And one of the huge aspects of that was asking specifically and clearly for what you want. And there are a lot of women here, and this is much, women are way worse at this than men because the culture teaches them not to ask. 
and this is frankly why women are often man manipulative, is because they're trying to get what they want without directly asking. So there's a lot of hinting, there's a lot of implying, without direct asking. And this is gonna make such a huge difference in your life when you clearly and boldly ask for what you want and you ask the person who can give it to you. Not their secretary, not the person you hope will tell them, but when you directly, boldly ask for what you want. I was uh, reading this, there was a, like a round table discussion and I think it was probably videoed, but I just was reading some of the transcripts of it that Variety does these every now and then. It was a bunch of women who were basically more or less comedic actresses and stuff. So it was Lena Dunham and Amy Schumer and, um, oh, I can't remember, Diana Ross's daughter's name, who's on Blackish, and, um, oh, the woman that plays, I love that, I just started watching this show. Uh, about Kimmy Schmidt that's on Netflix. If you've ever seen that, you have to just, that's so freaking hilarious. Um, so it was a bunch of these women, and they were talking about this, and the thing that, you know, and Amy Schumer has just burst into success after many years of working very hard, but they were talking about, because Amy Schmidt, she is the head of her own show, as well as the movie that she just wrote and that just came out, and of course, Lena Dunham, the same thing. One of the things that Amy Schumer said that I thought was great in this interview as they were talking to each other was she said, I went and saw, you know, before my show went into production, I went and watched Lena doing Girls and I watched uh, Tina Fey doing 30 Rock and she said it was so wonderful to see them just calling the shots. Just say, just running the show without, I want you to hear this, without apology. She had a whole thing on her show that was based on this, of how women tend to apologize before they ask for something. Or just apologize all the time. Just constantly, I'm sorry, but well, why are you sorry? <laughs> for what? <laughs> what? I'm sorry, but I need that. What is the apology for? This is the idea of ask and it is given, not whine and hint and beg and, <laughs> right? It's just, people will say no, that's fine, move on. But it's the idea of asking for what you want. Now, I got an email this week. This one from my phone up here. I got an email this week. You know, I do miracle reports on my, on my blog, and then I, I will sometimes post them like to Facebook. This is one I got this week. Very short. I love it. Jacob, just for fun, I asked for $100,000, and yesterday I got it. <laughs> I'm freaking serious. I haven't been sending you miracle reports because I'd be flooding your inbox. Your lectures keep me going. That was it, that's the whole thing. Oh yeah, I asked for $100,000 and I got it. Did you ask for $100,000? <laughs> Dear Jacob, this is another one. Dear Jacob, I'm so thrilled with your recent move and all that you share with us. I recently took a trip to Hawaii that was on my vision board and experienced beauty and love on epic levels. I say that's for me so often now. Thank you for being you. This is clarity. This is clarity. This is the clarity of do you know, can you concisely say what you want? If you're afraid to say what you want, if you think it's unspiritual, or you think people will reject you, or think all of this, that's why you're not having more of what you want. Whatever it is, whether it's more money, more success, more health, more time, more energy, more peace of mind, more love, do you ask for what you want? Sometimes I will, and I'm getting so belligerent about this. Because I want people to really understand what they're doing. Louise Hay says at the beginning of You Can Heal Your Life, and this is so true, and you've, many of you who are, who are practitioners or therapists or anything like that, you know this to be true as well. But she said, when I meet with a new client, she said, I just listen to them. And she said, I can tell in a very short period of time, based on the way they language things, exactly why their life is the way it is. You can tell by the way people are talking. 
why their life is the way that it is. You are languaging it into being. That's why, you know, the early metaphysicians all said, post a guard at the door of your mind. Part of this sabbatical was I turned away from much of the world. I gave up what, what Christian Northrup calls negative pleasure. <laughs> negative pleasure is TMZ. Negative pleasure is e-entertainment television. Negative pleasure is the inquirer. Negative pleasure is getting off on seeing that other people are doing worse than you are. Right? Just the gossipy things that keep your energy from really soaring. So I, turned, I also turned away from everything else that's going on in the spiritual world anywhere ever. I don't want to know what any other teachers or writers are doing at all, period. You start to talk to me about this book you read, I will walk away. I only am in my yard now. Do you know how happy it is in your yard? <laughs> Do you know how awful it is looking over in their yard? What are they doing over there? <laughs> That's not right. <laughs> they should stop. Stop doing that. <laughs> it ends the war. I ended a huge war this week. The war I had with the culture, the war I had with religion, the war I had with all of these things. And I came to this place again of, oh, good for them. That has nothing to do with me. Good for them. That has nothing to do with, oh, good for them. That's so awesome. Live cockfights on TV. That's awesome. Good for them. Because right, it feels like that's what's next. Going there, I'm like, good for them. That has nothing to do with me. Right? I watch TCM all day. Old movies. I pay no attention whatsoever. This is what Louise Hay said. This is a great affirmation. This is going to disturb some of you. It's OK. <laughs> Louise Hay affirmation that says, I am no longer curious about things that will upset me. I am no longer curious about things that will upset me me. But you think you should be as a citizen. I should care about this thing that makes me take antidepressants <laughs> and then say it's a chemical imbalance when actually I've just been filling my head full of garbage. We have so many erroneous beliefs in this culture. Like people think, now this might upset you too, that venting helps. It does not. Venting, the reason that people feel good when they vent is the same reason that you feel good when you vomit when you have food poisoning. <laughs> you don't actually feel good. What you feel is relief. So what a lot of people think, or what a lot of people are confused about, is the difference between actual peace and relief. So. The reason that we need to vent is because we've been eating a lot of toxic things, meaning the news, gossip, family, drama, a lot of stuff that we're judging our family or the society. So we're taking in all of this toxic stuff. Instead of saying, you know what? I'm going to be responsible for what I focus my attention on. And I'm going to focus on the things that feel good and keep me in alignment with source. And I don't care that the society says it's irresponsible. What has the society ever done for me other than make me feel worried about shit that never happens? So I'm going to focus on the things that feel good when I focus on them in order to keep my vibration and my energy and my consciousness in alignment with source. I mean, Jesus was criticized for this too. Jesus was criticized for not caring about the world. He didn't care about the world. He said, you will always have the poor with you. Why will you always have the poor with you? Because we all have free will. We all have a different consciousness. But when we, listen, this will rock your world if you've never heard this before. One of the major causes of depression is actually somebody who is a huge wanter but does not believe that they can actually have what they want. 
That's the cause of so much depression in our society, is it's people who want a lot, but don't actually believe that it's possible to have what they want. Now, in some cases, that is people who care so much about the world, and of course you can't have what you want if it's the world. If what you are devoted to is, I can't be happy because I won't ever be happy until all children are fed and we're at peace, then just get, make friends with depression. Because you're never going to have that because we have free will. So people can have more. See, that's the thing about free will is we are all for free will if it's us. I'm totally for free will as long as nobody else would make a choice I don't want them to make. But that's not free will. Free will is that people get to drop bombs if they want to. That's free will. So when you say we have to create a world where that doesn't happen, then what you've said is we have to create a world where free will doesn't exist anymore where people only make the choices that are the approved of choices according to who then. All right, so that's the preamble to the talk. <laughs> We're ready to start now. <laughs> Let's go to Ask and It Is Given. And I love this because the book basically starts out with, <laughs> with that. Now, one of the things that we say here that Abraham says all the time too is nothing is more important than that I feel good. But I want to clarify that more to say, because we tend to think that means pleasure. But that's not what it means. What it means is nothing is more important than that I am in alignment with source. Because nothing feels better than that. Nothing feels better than that. So that means that you might not like what's happening, but you still feel in alignment. So you may have a child who's dying. You're not going to feel pleasure in that. But if you are in alignment with source, you will have that peace that passes all understanding. You won't approve it. You'll still cry. You'll still grieve. All of that will go on. But underneath that is your awareness and your peace and the grace of connection to source. That's what they mean when they say nothing is more important than that I feel good. Nothing is more important than my alignment. So you ask yourself then more regularly all the time, what's this decision I'm about to make going to do to my alignment? That's why I said, I'm less nice than ever. <laughs> now, I wasn't very nice to begin with. <laughs> but I will say, I'm kinder than ever. And there's a difference. You know, if you've ever seen, I love the musical Into the Woods. And the, one of the songs in Little Red Riding Hood, who knows nothing about the world at the beginning. You know, she's an innocent. So she knows nothing about the world at the beginning of the play. You know, the wolf hasn't eaten her grandmother yet. She's just been at home. So she goes out and she finds out what life is like, what the world is like. And one of the things that she sings in the song after she's, they've been through a lot, a lot of horrible things and people have died and all kinds of stuff has gone down. She says, I found that good is different than nice. They're not the same thing. Good is different than nice. Kind is different than nice. This is something women need to learn, too. A lot of times women are trying to be nice, and it costs them their happiness and their joy, because they're doing things to be nice, and it's not kind. It's not kind to themselves or to the other person. Let me explain to you <laughs> a real life experience that I recently had. So an old friend of mine who lives in Palm Springs, uh, who <laughs> invited me to have dinner. And this, in, during my sabbatical, I pretty much said, I'm not going to have lunch or dinner with anybody. This is a time of just resetting my clock. But it was right after my birthday, and, she, and I just moved out, and she said, come, my birthday, and da, da Oh, great, a birthday dinner. OK, well, I'll do it. I, don't, I didn't want to go. What was I doing? I was being nice. I didn't want to hurt her feelings. So I was being nice. Within five minutes of sitting down with her, I wanted to punch her in the face. <laughs> Almost as soon as I sat down, she said, well, you know, I've been dealing with depression, and I sleep 12 hours a night now, and they cut back my hours at work, and I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm like, well, happy birthday to me. <laughs> party, party, party. Did you bring a hat? <laughs> right? <laughs> So I realized that 
being nice made me then shift out of that place where if I had not, if I just hurt her feelings in the beginning by not having dinner with her, then I would have hurt her feelings and she would have done whatever that she wanted to. And instead, I went to dinner with her and formed a grievance. Now I really don't ever want to see her again. Right? So now it's all about me healing my grievance. <laughs> oh my God, now I'm going to let that go. When if I would have just said, no, I don't want to have dinner, it would have been a done deal, no big deal. Right? So that's the difference between nice and kind. The kind thing is hurt their feelings right away. <laughs> right? By owning your no. This is when scripture says, let your yeas be yeas and your nays be nays. Own your no. Right? This is, again, this is another thing, especially for women, that women will be nice. This is another reason why women have trouble asking directly. Because here's the deal between women. A woman doesn't have to fully ask another woman. She will hint and the woman will volunteer because what they're saying is, I know you don't really want to ask and get rejected, so I'm going to volunteer so that then when I hint, you'll volunteer for me. So that's kind of the agreement. And I'll just say, God, I don't know, it's really overwhelming doing this. And the other one will go, oh, I'll come over and help you. So that you don't ever have to directly ask. Hinting. It's just hinting and implying and whatever, you know. Right? Instead of just coming right out and saying, I mean, I want you to really start practice being wildly, specifically direct. Because what we tend to do instead is we're vague about the asking, then we micromanage how you do it. So we're in the part we shouldn't be in. Do you see what I'm saying? We're saying, I won't directly ask you to help me move this, but if you volunteer, then I'm going to tell you exactly how you should do it. Don't lift it that way. Lift it this way. Don't do it at this. Don't wear that. Wear this. That's none of your business. Once they've said they're going to help you, then how they do it is really none of your business. So all of this is true with the universe, too. We do the exact same thing. We get in the part of telling the universe how to do it. If we knew how, we would need the universe. <laughs> Our part is to ask, and it is given, right? It unfolds the way it unfolds. OK, so chapter three. The basis of your life is absolute freedom. You were born with an innate knowledge that you do create your own reality. And in fact, that knowledge is so basic within you that when someone attempts to thwart your own creation, you feel an immediate discord within yourself, right? As soon as someone tries to stifle your freedom, you immediately feel that, oh, that disconnect. You were born knowing that you are the creator of your own reality, and although that desire to do so pulsed within you in a powerful way, you began to integrate into your society. You began to accept much of the same picture that others held of the way your life should unfold. But still within you today lives the knowledge that you are the creator of your own life experience, that absolute freedom exists as the basis of your true experience, and that ultimately the creation of your life experience is absolutely and only up to you. Now, this is harsh, but true. It's super harsh. You know, people think A Course in Miracles is so gentle. A Course in Miracles says it way harsher than that. There's a whole section of the Course that's so frickin' ruthless, where it says, when it has you say, it says, everything that happens to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. There's nothing ambivalent about that. There's nothing like, wonder what he means. <laughs> oh, it says, everything that happens to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. OK? You have never enjoyed someone else telling you what to do. You have never enjoyed being dissuaded from your own powerful impulses. But over time, with enough pressure from those who surrounded you who seemed convinced that their practiced way was more valid than your way, and therefore ultimately better, you gradually began to release your determination to guide your own life. You found it easier just to adapt to their ideas of what was best for you rather than trying to figure it out for yourself. But in all this adapting to your society's attempts to make you fit in, and in your own attempt to find less trouble, you have unwittingly relinquished your most basic foundation, your total and absolute freedom to create. 
for the day that you let go of what other people think is your rebirth. When you let go of what the family, the society, the world says, then you're born. That is what it means to be reborn, to let go of, as Esther says, giving a rip what anyone thinks. This is the life I'm going to create for myself. This is what I want. This is what I'm going to focus on. This is what I'm going to do. And what you can do in order to start to create that freedom is start looking at and writing down all the shoulds that arise in your mind in a given day. Oh my God. Listen, this is a great exercise to do in the morning is sit down and just take out a notebook and just start writing down, start with other people, how they should be living. <laughs> and just let your mind free, just free from person to person and think. So be, be like, you know, family members and job members and Congress and the Vatican and the, everything of what everybody should be doing and shouldn't be doing. Then you can add yourself in there after you've done all that, what you should be doing and shouldn't be doing. And then if what, what happens to me in a very short period of time and what I would assume would probably happen with you if you're in your right mind is, at a certain point, it will become hilarious to you. <laughs> Absolutely, hysterically hilarious to you that you thought you were gonna be able to be happy with thoughts like that. And the way that Byron Katie talks about it is she says, when you start looking at all this, she'll say to people, she'll say, well, all right, look at you, little Hitler. <laughs> Dictator of how the whole universe should be run, how everyone should be running their lives. We've got you, we don't need a God. You knowing how everybody should be living their lives and what they should be doing, right? And so this is this freedom, this beginning to see, well, how do you want to live your life? And part of that then is, having the courage to say it and to ask for what you want, to ask specifically of people, and then to ask the universe, right? This one was like, I asked for $100,000 and I got it, right? People say, I would like more money, I give them a penny. <laughs> you have more money now, right? Spiritual people are too vague and wishy-washy. Like, if you need, how many new clients do you need? How much business do you want to do this month? Why are we so vague about things? Right? Instead of be clear, be specific. People love it. When this is, if you see somebody in the world who's achieving a lot of what they want, it's because they're clear about what they want and they are not afraid to ask for it. One of the things that the, um, I can't remember which of the women in this round table was saying this, but she has a boyfriend She has a boyfriend who's like a rock singer or something, but he wasn't something, somebody I'd ever heard of because he was not a musician from the 80s. So <laughs> I had not heard of him. Uh, but, <laughs> but anyhow, she was talking about, she said, it, and of course this is the difference between the way men and women are raised, but what was great was is that she learned from his experience is she said, I will hear him on the phone saying, no, that's not enough, I deserve more than that. So he's saying, I want more money than that. And he knows what he is worth. Do you know what you're worth? Are you willing to ask for what you're worth? Are you afraid to ask because they might say no? Mm -hmm. Right? This is what we talked about last year. We did that whole thing about what would you do if you weren't afraid? What would you ask for if you weren't afraid? How much more alive would you be if you were willing to let go of your resistance and walk through that fear? So she said, I learned from him to, like he would just say, no, I'm worth more than that. Like that was revelatory to her, to say to the person, I am worth more than that. And then Amy Schumer uh, said in response to that, I can't remember who the woman was, but a Amy Schumer said, yes, I started at a certain point doing that with club owners. She said, because I would say to them, I'm the only reason they're coming to your club that night. So I'm gonna ask for what I want, right? But you have to then deal with how that feels to ask for what 
you want and to know you deserve it. To be clear, really, this is what I want. There was a woman who came, uh, and it was great because she was in the class last week in West Hollywood, but she had come at the beginning uh, of my little classes in my We Hosendo, and she had come absolutely devastated, crying, sobbing. She had come to hear me speak in Santa Barbara several times, but her husband had sent me an email and said, how much are the classes? I want to give you know, my wife a gift of like three months worth of classes. So he sent me the donation. She started coming to class and she sat there and just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. The whole, from the minute I opened my mouth, she just sobbed and sobbed. sobbed. <laughs> <laughs> Which in a tiny little room of 12, you know, <laughs> seats, it was like, she's having an epiphany here. So she was, but she was just unburdening. Well, what, what had happened was that she had had a miscarriage. Mm, I'm gonna say like six weeks or so before that and she had gotten very depressed. Something you really want, believe you can't have, right? I mean, there was the grief of that, but that was the real thing. The depression, there was grief, but the depression was something you really want, don't know if you can have her. So as soon as I started the opening prayer, then she just saw, well, that was release. That's that surrendering, just letting it flow out. By the next week, for whatever reason, I gave everyone, and one of the things that I love to do, and that's why I loved having groups that size, was to just buy books and give them away. So I wouldn't just recommend, I would have them for everybody. So at that time, I gave out uh, Ernest Holmes' The Art of Life. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. She devoured that book, okay? She read that book, because she said by the next week, she said that she had read it like four times over the weekend. By the time like two weeks had gone by, she said, I maybe read it 30 times. Wow. So she was reading the whole thing like in a day because she wasn't working. And so she would read it like almost every day. Mm -hmm. And don't you know, within a very short period of time, she was pregnant. <laughs> and before you know it, you know, she stopped coming to the class because she had her baby and now the baby's will turn a year old, like in a week or so, or maybe this week. So she was there with pictures and stuff of the baby. But she, like her with that book, was exactly what she needed because she had absolutely none of that, I don't know where the hell she came from, okay? Because she was driving up from Los Angeles to Santa Barbara to see me, but I don't know where she'd ever even heard of me because this was before I was lecturing for Marianne or anything like that. So she, I don't know where she heard about And she was not like a big spiritual person who went to religious science church. I don't know where she came from. So that was great, because she didn't have a lot of spiritual bullshit baggage. So she was absolutely clear on, I want a baby, and that's it, and I want a baby. I'm going to get me a baby. <laughs> right? So then when she had the miscarriage, then it was the thought of maybe I'm not going to be able to have a baby. So that's the depression. Strong wanting, but not necessarily believing or knowing if you can have that. Well, then the art of life said, you can. You absolutely can. And here's what you do. So she just read it and 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 had a baby. <laughs> it was like, you know, just it for her. She didn't need anything else. And that's the thing when you give yourself permission. Permission to live as you choose, to trust yourself. It's okay for me to live the life I choose. This is what Abraham is saying with absolute freedom. We don't like it when we don't have freedom. Something that I remember Abraham saying that I thought was so wise and so freaking awesome and so simple was about, it was, it was during the question period where some person asked and about their their son was playing all these video games all the time. And of course, she immediately was like, that's wrong. You know, because he's not having social interactions and he's grouchy, he's not in the thing. And of course, Abraham always is like, well, that's your problem because he's totally in alignment and in his joy and leave him alone. You know, he's like, you're, Abraham basically said, you're an old hag and you think, you know, which everyone is. Can I just tell you, that's what old age is. And it's been going on since the invention of the wheel the, here's what old age is. Old age is, in my day, that's it, that's old age. It doesn't matter if you're Methuselah, 
It doesn't matter who the hell you are, as soon as your thought is, in my day, you're old. And get the hell off the planet. Nature is done with you. Right? And that's what Abraham is always saying. Abraham was saying, he is totally, she said, the children that are born today already have the chip. They are wired to hook in. And you're saying they shouldn't be doing that based on what society says. He is in alignment and is joy. And you look at him and go out of alignment. Because you are judging him in his joy. Right? And trying to deny him his freedom by saying, don't do that. Right? Do what I want you to do. So what Abraham said, which I thought this was so great, and they said, it's so amazing that we don't want to give them any freedom. And we plan everything out for them, and then we wonder why they make bad decisions. Because we haven't given them practice in making decisions or trusting them. So he said, so Abraham goes, so so many times people, adults, will look at a little child and say, what do you want to be when you grow up when this child isn't even yet allowed to decide what they're going to wear or what they're going to eat today? So they can't even choose their socks or lunch, but you want to know what they're going to be forever. What are you going to do with the whole rest of your life, even though you weren't allowed to wear your tutu today? Right? So we're all about restricting. The agreement is it's that old you know, thing that they talk about where we're all, we all have like a silent agreement to hold each other down. Nobody rise above. Just let's nobody rise above. And if you start to rise above, it's that thing of, what is it? Is it the, the lobsters that they talk about will drag the lobster back? If one of their friends starts to get out, the lobster will drag him back. Where do you think you're going? We're all dying together in here. <laughs> right? You're not happy for your friends. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> right? This is the sign of a huge evolution in your consciousness is when you are truly happy for the success of your compatriots, basically, of the people around you, even though they don't deserve it. <laughs> Did you get that last part? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not talking about you're happy for the person that you really like a lot, and you're in this together, and blah, 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 we're going to ride. You know, I'm going to hitch my wagon to your star. We're talking about the person who didn't deserve it. That's spiritual maturity. And that's what this person was writing about in this letter when they said, I walk around saying, that's for me. I align myself with, when I see the freedom of someone else, I align myself with that. That's, you look and say, that is not what I would choose, but how wonderful that you are free. It inspires me to be free. I wrote an article that is in this month's Rage Monthly. It's so weird to write spiritual articles for a magazine called Rage, but <laughs> I do. So anyhow, it's out right now, and it was, they asked me to write for Gay Pride. So in it, I was it talks about compare and despair, and I said because one of the things that you know the the idea of pride is we're all one community, and isn't it great that we celebrate our diversity, and we used to be an oppressed people, and it just gets better all the time, and then when you're there, that's not always what happens, because you start looking around and thinking. Mm, they shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> Why are they like that? That's not what I do. They're re misrepresenting my community. I don't want people to think that that's what I would do. Or you look at other people and go, Why do they have that? I don't have that. They have 3% body fat and a hot boyfriend. They have a child and a big home. And I live in a van down by the river. <laughs> right? There's all of that looking at other people Right? And instead of being in that place of really celebrating diversity, we all get to choose. Isn't it great that we all get to choose and we all choose different things? And we all are different. We're all unique expressions of that one life that we can get into. Uh, 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 ooh. I don't know. I was feeling better before I came to this party. Right? So it's always constantly just being on watch with what's going on in your own consciousness. Can you look and say, good for them, that's not for me, but good for them. Good for them, right? Instead of you know, spending so much time where we're pushing against something we don't want, right? 
it always reminds me of that Woody Allen story. One of the, I can't remember what movie where he tells the story at the beginning of the two women at the restaurant who were complaining and saying, the food here is terrible. And the other woman goes, and such small portions. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> there's not enough of this horrible food. Right? It's that weird thing that we do where we keep going back to the thing we don't like and keep saying how much we don't like it. Instead of just saying, just don't have that. If you don't like it, stop watching that show that disturbs you. Right? Stop signing up for the email where they send you the bad news. Stop torturing yourself. Stop torturing yourself. You know, the first talk I ever gave at Pacific Church when I was guest speaking in like 1999 was stop tormenting yourself. And it holds true today, that thing of where we think we're doing something responsible when actually we're just tormenting ourselves over nothing, needlessly over nothing, right? It's the right thing to do to investigate this horrifying thing that I can't do anything about anyhow. So I know. If you need to know, somebody will tell. But sometimes it's like, why would you want to know anyhow? Wouldn't you want to just party right up till the last freaking second and go, ooh, meteor, <laughs> then that's not like you're done. <laughs> Or do you want to be worried about it all weekend? It's on the way. It will annihilate all of Earth. It's coming. It's coming. I'd rather not know. <laughs> rather just be like, oh, he had fun right up to the very end. Didn't even know. We woke him up on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> right? That whole thing. Death is perfectly safe. You'll survive it. <laughs> Birth is the difficult transition. <laughs> all right. OK. Without asking, you will receive no answer. Sometimes people will compliment Esther for being able to receive the wisdom of Abraham and for putting it into written or spoken word for others to experience and receive benefit from, and we also add our appreciation to that. But we also want to point out that Esther's receiving and translation of our vibration is only part of the equation. Without the asking that precedes it, there could be no answering. Now, one of the things that Esther used to talk about a lot with Jerry was that she was the perfect channel, and they were the perfect couple for this because Jerry had so many questions. And Esther would always say, and Esther wasn't really curious about much of anything. So she was the perfect channel because sometimes the asking interferes with hearing because we're so invested in asking, 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 asking. And this is what I want to make sure I make clear when I talk to you about asking is once you've asked, then let it go and get into receiving mode. Don't stay in the question. Don't stay in the badgering, whether it's a person or the universe. Once it's asked, you have to get out of the asking mode because that is not a receptive mode. So you can't receive what you've asked for if you're still in asking mode. Two completely different vibrations. Ask, relax, receive. What I used to say is affirm, believe, relax, receive. Affirm, believe, relax, receive. Now I'm going to read a little bit here. How much time do I have before I'm dead? Oh, that's plenty. Okay. This is, this is um, and I believe more and more and more that Ernest Holmes was the greatest teacher, spiritual teacher of our time. I really do. But now this is not Ernest Holmes. This is one of his teachers, Thomas Troward. So this is a big book. I was reading this the other day at the coffee shop, and some guy went by and like, that's a big book. <laughs> yes, it is a big book. It's got a lot of words in it. And this is actually put out by uh, Tarcher Penguin. So it's The Power in You, the Definitive Thomas Troward. And this is, so it's like six different books all in this uh, one book. And I just want to see here. And this is in the section, The Divine Giving, where he's talking about um, the promises, the biblical promises. And he's really talking about belief. The secret is this. We are not bearing the burden ourselves. We are not trying to force things on the external plane by our objective powers, not yet on the subjective plane by trying to compel the spirit. Therefore, though diligent in our calling, we are at rest. And the foundation of this rest is that we believe in a divine promise. And the promise is in the nature of the divine being. 
This is why the Bible lays so much stress upon the idea of promise. Promise is the law of creative power simplified to the utmost simplicity. I'm skipping around here. The reason why this is made the starting point of faith is that we start with an undoubted fact that the universe exists. Then a little consideration will show us that it must have had its origin in the thought of the universal spirit before its manifestation in time and space. So that here we start with another self-evident fact, and these two obvious and incontrovertible facts supply us with premises from which to reason, so that knowing our premises to be true, we know that our conclusion must be true also if we only reason correctly from the premises. This is the logic of it all. This is, of course, what I love about Ernest Holmes is that he makes it logical. Two and two is four, no matter who you are. Doesn't matter about your feelings. I know, but I feel in my emotions that two and two is five. Well, we don't care about your feelings. What we care about is the logic of the principle that two and two is four, no matter who you are or where you live or what your feelings are. Right? So we start from the logic of that, and then everything comes from that. But if your basic premise is that two and two is five, then everything you do from that point is wrong. Everything that you do from a wrong premise will be wrong. Then the reasoning proceeds as follows. In the beginning, there were no antecedent conditions, and the whole creation came out of the desire of the spirit for self-expression. By the nature of the case, the conception of the existence of any antecedent conditions is impossible. And so we see that creation from within as distinguished from construction from without, has the entire absence of predetermining and limiting conditions as its distinguishing characteristic. In other words, there's no predetermination, there's no limitation. It's whatever you can imagine. And this is everything to me now. This is why I'm really wonka now. Mm -hmm. Everything is about what you can imagine. This is why Einstein said that imagination is more important than knowledge more important than knowledge. Then our thought, inspired by the promise, is so to say reflected back into the mind of the universal experience in direct relation to ourselves, and thus becomes part and parcel of the self-realization of spirit in connection with ourselves personally, thus bringing about a working of the creative law of reciprocity from the standpoint of our own individuality and because the activity thus called forth is that of the original creative energy, the first cause itself, it is as unhampered by antecedent conditions as was the original cosmic creation itself. This is what it means to say that principle is not held back by past precedent. It doesn't matter that nobody has ever done it in the history of mankind. If you are an open channel and you can see it and accept it, it's got a vessel to come through. It is not held back by past precedent. I've gone more fully into this subject in my creative process in the individual, but I hope I have now said sufficient to make the general principle clear and to show that the Bible promises are nothing else than the statement of the essential creativeness of the all-originating spirit when operating in reciprocity with the individual mind. If we believe in the power of affirmation, then trust in the divine promise is the strongest affirm then the Trust in the divine promise is the strongest affirmation that we can make. Our trust is the strongest affirmation, more than an actual affirmation. It is the asking, then the letting go, and opening to receive, and trusting that it's done. That we will be guided and directed if there is something for us to do. And if we believe in the power of denials, then such a simple trust is also the strongest denial we can make for being absolute confidence. It constitutes an emphatic denial of any power whether in the invisible or the invisible, to prevent the fulfillment of the promise. In other words, nothing can stop it. No worldly power, no princes or principalities can deny it. It is for this reason that the Bible lays such stress on belief in the divine promises as the way to receive the blessing. The Bible was written for the benefits of any reader, whether learned or unlearned, and takes into consideration the fact that the latter are by far more numerous Therefore, it reduces the matter to its simplest elements. Hear the promise, believe it, and receive its fulfillment. Ask, and it is given. If you are not receiving, it is because you do not ask, or you ask amiss. Directly, clearly, this is what, do you know, 
How many of you people have your own businesses? Don't you love it when people are clear with what they want so that you know what to give them or, or even to say, I won't give you that because that's not available. What makes everything difficult is not really known. This is, we talked about this last week in class about relationships, is what ruins so many relationships is not, is thinking they should know. I shouldn't have to ask or say it. We've been together 30 years. If they don't know, know me, I shouldn't have to. Well, have a happy divorce <laughs> or a miserable marriage, whichever you prefer. But it is just the clarity of would you, the difference between I really need some help this weekend and Bob, would you at 5 o'clock help me carry this case upstairs? is the difference between success and failure. That's the difference between success and failure, is I really need some help is not asking. A lot of times when people think they've asked, what they've told me is, are things about what they want without having asked for what they want. Well, you've told me all about what you want, you just haven't asked me for it. So therefore, I'm not giving until you ask. When you ask clearly, concisely, and directly, then you will get a very clear yes or no. It's going to save you so much time. If you just leave here today thinking about letting go of any ambiguity about what you want and what is important to you, and to just really start the practice of being clear about what you want, it just makes everything so, it, it really just, you, first of all, you stop leaking energy. We leak so much, we're just spewing like a car where the, the hose is going <laughs> Of all this energy, we're leaking about, you know, what they should have done. They, they should have known that I wanted this way. They, I, I gave them this and they should have But did you ask? Was it clear to them? Right? Instead of these underground deals that we make that the other person doesn't even know about. That's the beauty of that book that we talk about sometimes, The Five Languages of Love is where couples a lot of times think that they're giving something. See, this is another aspect of relationships is that, I was talking about this, as, again, as somebody who's in business and who's sort of in the public eye and all that kind of stuff, is that so many times what you, what you just see the miscommunication. You see how bad people are communicating, first of all. And one of the things that I said is that if somebody complains to me about something, I really don't give a shit if I don't know who you are. In other words, if you have not been somebody who's been contributing or acknowledging me along the way or thanking me, then I don't care that you didn't like something because you're trying to make a withdrawal on an account where you've made no deposits. <laughs> but if you're somebody who sends me letters now and then, I need encouragement doing this. I encourage a lot of people, so I need encouragement to do this. So if I have letters from people saying, thank you so much, that was a great class, love what you did, you're really great today, you were really on it, this is fabulous, then if I get about 20 of those from somebody and they have a complaint, I listen. Because they're making a withdrawal from an account that they have made lots of deposits in. And a lot of relationships end because people are trying to make a withdrawal from an account that's already overdrawn. Because a lot of times what they've been doing is making deposits that the other person didn't consider deposits. It's only a deposit if the other person considers it a deposit. That's what the five languages of love is about. Meaning that if you think a deposit is, like for instance, if someone gives me a book, I consider that a major withdrawal in our relationship. Because I don't want a freaking book. You can shove that book up your ass. I don't want your book. I don't care. To me, you've given me an assignment now. I'm not interested in this book or I would have bought it myself. Now you're going to ask me about it and in order for me to no longer be nice but be kind, I'm going to say this is the biggest pile of horse shit I've ever read. I'm sorry that it changed your life. That makes me now think differently about you. Should have kept your freaking book. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Now I'm <laughs> that was just the end of the tape. <laughs> but you have to, 
in order to be in relationship, you must get to know that person and find out what they consider a deposit. What is meaningful to them? Not, I want you to have this because I love this, is not a deposit or a gift. It's not a gift. It's a withdrawal from the relationship. It's an assignment. Now you have work to do. You better like this. You better enjoy it, right? No, a gift is, I got this because I know you love this. I know you care about this. I asked you this and this and this, so I know that da 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 There's a guy in Palm Springs that, honestly, he has given me so the most, I, I don't even know how many gifts he's given me in the last like month or so. It's unbelievable, and they're all fabulous because they're all gift certificates. <laughs> they're all like gift certificates to restaurants, to clothing stores, to da -da -da, it's all this stuff where it's like, here, you go pick what you want. Mm. Right? Doesn't take up any space, doesn't take up any room, right? I just gave away 500 books. Now someone's going to give me a book? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm driving it straight to the thrift store. Right? But that's what I'm saying, is that you have to look at the relationship. What are you depositing that then allows you to make the withdrawal? So if there's somebody who, so in general, this is just a rule of thumb. Just look and see. If you're going to criticize somebody or give them feedback, you better have given them 500 compliments before that for every time you criticize or have a suggestion. I'd say that eliminates almost all suggestions from your life, pretty much, right? But somebody that you are constantly just making, you know, say, you look wonderful today, that was what, whatever it is, then, I mean, isn't that true? If somebody criticizes you and they have not been building you up over time, don't you just think, oh, I don't care. You're never here you know, to lift me up. Why would I care what you think when I only hear from you when you're upset about something? You are the furthest thing from my mind about making any kind of change. But somebody who is right there all the time, somebody who is really like, in your corner and building you up all the time, then that is somebody that when they have a suggestion, you go, you know, they have built up trust in the relationship. They have, uh, what is it um, that you have in a house? Equity. They have equity. They have relationship equity that they're drawing on, right? And the interesting thing is, is if you're coming from that state of mind where you're building up equity in your life in general, that's what <laughs> last week when I was talking about, if you want more out of life, you get more out of life by putting more into life. So you are building up energetic equity all the time by what you are bringing to life, to your health, to your relationship, to your job, to everything, that you're building up that kind of equity so that then, even if the withdrawal you're making is unreasonable and crazy, you can get away with shit. Right? Somebody will allow that if you have really built up a lot of trust over time. They'll go, well, he's a little crazy and insane right now. So we'll just go ahead. But if you're just a little bit crazy and insane and you've never been there for that person, they're going to be like, good luck with that. <laughs> Hope that all works out for you. Good luck with that little life of yours. Right? So it is, it is so much of this is about communication. How are we? Are you really asking for what you want? Are you really then expecting it? Are you releasing it? Are you really telling people what you feel? feel from that place of connection, not what you feel from that place of disconnection. We're always so willing to communicate from our place of disconnection. When we feel disconnected from source, then we want to vent with you, right? But what we come to understand is that venting is just activating more of what you don't want. So as I was saying earlier, it's like vomiting when you have food poisoning. But the difference is this, is when we are venting, which is like, I'm just going to tell you, we're going to get together and have a bitch fest. I'm going to tell you everything that I'm feeling, everything I don't like about my husband, everything about my job that sucks, everything that's not going right in my life. I'm going to vent it and I will feel better. That's like having food poisoning, vomiting, and then going back and eating more of the shrimp that gave you food poisoning. That's what venting is. Venting is, okay, I've let it all out. Now I can go back home and continue judging my husband and my this and my that, and then we'll get together in another week and vent about it. Because we just keep activating more of the same thing. And this is why a lot of people never freaking get out of therapy. Because they're going every week to just vent, 
to just vent, to just vent. And that's why the enlightened therapist is different now. So many therapists now are becoming much more in alignment with what we would call life coaches, where what's happening is, is people are coming together with a therapist and saying, let us set up basically strategies for you living your dreams. Instead of just venting what's wrong and what happened in your child, let's activate when you were three years old and this happened and that happened. Let's activate that and let's get that. Listen, at a certain point, I'm not even close to winding down here. If you have to go, go ahead. Because um, we have the CD's already over, so we're good. Uh, <laughs> but one of the phenomena, I've been doing this long enough, there's a phenomenon that I've seen happen where people feel like, it's easier to just go back to being depressed because it is too hard controlling my thoughts all the time. So it's easier to just stop controlling them and just feel depressed and horrible all the time because people don't realize how much work that is. And I've had people do this over the years, and it's interesting because it doesn't bother me anymore, but where somebody is really winning and really thriving, and then they will find what Abraham says, who are you using as your excuse to cut yourself off from source? So they will find some excuse that will then allow them to go back to, hello, is that the ring? Uh, that will allow them then, that would basically validate, oh good, I can stop doing all of this guiding my thinking and just blame my mother. I can just go back to she was a horrible bitch and she was toxic and she had narcissistic personality disorder and that's why I have all these problems I have. And now I can just stop doing this working on my thinking all the time. And I'm like, well, I don't care. I mean, that doesn't, people will act like, so there. Like it's hurting me. It's not hurting me. I don't care what you do. Do whatever you want to do. There was a woman who was so angry. Oh my God, so freaking angry. She's still angry. It reminds, there was a cartoon in the LA Weekly for years that was called The Angriest Dog in the World. Did you ever see it? It would be at the end of, there was like a leash. So it was always the same dog. So it was the end of a leash, a very choking at the end of so the writing underneath it was different every week, but every week was basically this, more or less the same picture for the dog, the angriest dog in the world. And it was probably at the end of it, he's going, ah! And so she reminds me of that. It's like it's years later, she hasn't seen or heard of me in years, and she's still pissed. And what's so funny is that her story is so bizarre because when she came in, her life, I, I don't know that her life was a mess, but she wasn't. I don't think she or her husband were working and they had financial difficulties and worries about the house and this and that and the other thing. And at that time, my whole thing was, you cannot even come to the groups if you've not done the required reading list because I don't want you wasting my time. Because this is what I believe, this is the foundation. If you disagree with this, you shouldn't come to hear me because this is what I'm gonna teach you. So it's foolish of you to waste my time and your time coming to something that you don't believe is true. So it was the four Spiritual Principles of Prosperity by Edwin Gaines. It was Ask and Is Given by Abraham. It was the Byron Katie material. And it was uh, Joel Goldsmith's Living by Grace. So she had read all of that and she was coming. She never came to class because she lived far away, but she was getting the CDs and she started tithing and everything started where she had a miracle baby. She started to get work. Her husband started working, all this stuff. And then at a certain point, she got Depressed, she, I think she had postpartum depression. She got depressed, so she started seeing this therapist, which to me was like such an old school, horrible therapist. Because first of all, she was telling this woman to read the drama of the gifted child, which is like, you know the woman that wrote that book died miserable and depressed. So right there, I would say, your therapist is a freaking lunatic. But anyhow, so the woman had basically told her, the therapist had basically told her, all your problems are your mother's fault, because she was horrible, and she's a narcissist, and she's this and that, and so, and she, and so the, the woman wrote to me and said, because uh, I had just written the book um, about thriving. I can't remember what it's called anymore. I can't remember the name of my own book. <laughs> but anyhow, she sent me an email saying, oh, Jacob, this is, I found out this is not true. Some of us are victims and not thrivers. And it's wrong to not think that you're a victim, and I am a victim, and my mother did do it to me, and da da da, and you need to stop teaching this stuff. And I was like, you need to suck my dick, okay? That's, if we're gonna tell each other, I mean, if we're gonna tell each other what we need to do, if that's what this is about now, I would love to tell you what you need to do. I didn't say that to her. But that was my thought of like, oh, okay, if we're telling each other what you need to do. Uh,
<laughs> no, you need to stop this, Ryan. You, need, you can't teach the Byron Katie stuff because it's not true, and you can't teach that, blah, 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 and all this stuff. Now, what was fascinating to me was I'd, for the couple of years, I'd gotten all these miracle things from her. And what really outraged her then, and she was telling people, like she had sent letters to Marianne Williamson saying, he's a horrible person, and I gave him $20,000 in tithes over two years, and da da da. And I was like, honey, if you gave me $20,000, that means you made $200,000, you stupid bitch. <laughs> when you were making any money when you're coming before. So, what you're saying is principle works, and it worked in my life, but I don't like it because I prefer being depressed and being a victim. So, you know, he needs to be stopped from preaching the principles that make people's lives better because some of us are victims, right? Now, she's still mad. It's years later because anytime I write a book, she doesn't buy it, but she reviews it with one star on Amazon and says, he's insane, he's a horrible person. <laughs> and I'm always like, well, on the Abraham scale, I'm happy for her because anger is higher than depression. So I know she's not depressed anymore because she's mad at me and her mother years later, right? But you do, you start to realize at a certain point that people will hit what we call their turnaround point, where even though everything is working, it feels easier to just go back to being angry and depressed. And this is something that Helen actually said. Helen Shuckman, who scribed the course, said, you know, I think she said this to Bill at one point. She said, it was easier, she said, when I was angry and crazed all the time because at least I felt like I knew what I was doing. <laughs> right? At least I felt like I was in control. I knew what I was doing. But this whole idea of this spiritual stuff, even though it feels good when I do it, I resent it. Right? I resent this. And so periodically along the path, you just look and see. I've done it myself where you backslide because it feels like can't I just hold on to this one resentment? <laughs> Can't I just be really pissed about this? That's why I said, I have gone to the desert on sabbatical, and it's amazing because I have not been there that long, and I just feel wildly different since I have turned away from anything that's happening outside my own yard. Where I'm just living in the realm of, this is what I want, this is the life I want to create, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to focus on, this is how I want to live my life. I am asking specifically for what I want, and I'm not asking for permission from other people or whether it's okay to want that. This is our joy in life. This is our joy in life. This is why it's a party. This is the Willy Wonka phase. This is the hot air balloon phase. This is the phase of imagineering. This is the phase of no more just being earthbound and making horizontal moves. This is the vertical ascent. This is the place where you rise up above. This, this is why everything is about the raising of consciousness, the lifting up of consciousness. What is it from up here? From up here, you look down, it is completely different. From here, from up here, you look down, there are no lines drawn between countries. You see, there is no difference between us here and us there, that it's all just one indivisible whole. Down here, it all seems so significant and so important and so limited, right? And from up here, it's like, what was I worried about? What was I worried about? It's such a greater uh, vantage point. OK, let me see. I will wind down here and <laughs> make sure that I've harassed you to the very nth degree about asking, asking, asking. Oh. I was reading this thing the other day on the internet. This was amazing. I was reading this where this guy, it's this blog that this guy writes. I can't even remember what it's called. But anyhow, it's this guy, uh, this gay guy who's probably around my age who's writing, written the whole history of basically his, his gay life, you know. And so he'll talk about relationships and this, that, and the other thing. And he told this story that I thought was fascinating about this guy that he called a vampire because <laughs> the guy was so pale. But anyhow, he said he was living in San Francisco at the time, and this guy walked up to him. And now, he's sort of into bodybuilders, so he likes sort of beefy you know, guys. And he said, this guy walked up to me who was like this thin, little, pale guy with, you know, who was completely not my type at all. And he said, and his breath sort of smelled like cigarettes and booze, and he was just not attractive to me at all. And the guy just walked up to me and said, I find you very attractive. I don't believe in small talk. I would like to make love to you, except he used the F word. I would like to, you know, what do you think? And the guy was like, there was no way that I was, I was not attracted to him at all, but we kept talking. And so, <laughs> 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 
And it just keeps going on that way, where he just keeps saying, okay, should we go home now? And then he was like, well, I'm not going to go home with this guy. So I said, well, you know, we, I don't, we should at least have dinner or something first. And the guy was like, oh, well, if you're so bourgeois that you think that we should have dinner first, then okay, we'll go. So they did all this, and they went to a bookstore, and, all, and the guy basically just kept saying, I want to F you. And the guy was like, I was like, and he, he did. He went home and had sex with him. And then he couldn't believe it. And they ended up in a relationship for six months of this of him constantly like, I'm not attracted to this guy, I don't want to be with him, and he would call and say, I want to take you out to dinner and then I want to F you. Uh, and he'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> he'd be like, he just went on and on and on. <laughs> and how hard it was to get rid of this guy. Of like, and he would do things to try to get rid of me. He said like, you know, after we'd only been together a week, I was like, I'm gonna chase him, I'm gonna tell him I want to meet my parents. So I was like, I want to meet my par your parents, I want you to meet my parents, and he's like, well, I think that's everything did was bourgeois. Well, that's very bourgeois of you, but yeah, okay, I mean. So he would just keep doing it. But the point was that this guy was absolutely clear about what he wanted, and he just kept asking for it. And even though this guy wasn't attractive, didn't want him at all, he just kept saying yes because the guy was so bold. He, can you imagine? Just like, I mean, if you imagine the kind of fear and worry and self-doubt that you have about, should I ask for that raise, or should I do this, or should I do that? And the people who are zooming ahead of you, for the most part, are people who don't have that kind of ambivalence about what they want. Now, we're not talking here about, we're talking about principle here. We're talking about activating principle and asking with boldness. We are not talking about by any means necessary. We're not saying that you get what you want by lying and cheating and stealing and rolling over other people and doing, we're not saying any of that kind of thing. It's not about the doing this. It's about the boldness of standing there, like planting yourself and saying, this is what I want and I want it from you. Are you willing to give it? That is power. That will shift your life in amazing ways if you don't just do it and then try it again in six months. Mm -hmm. Remember, it's the things that we do every single day. I remember a friend of mine who was in like, this at this time it was still like EST or something like that, but which became the Forum and Landmark Education, all this stuff. And I remember her calling me on the phone on a break because they'd had one of those assignments where they give you assignment and during the break you had to do that. So she called me and she said, um, would you wash my car? And I go, no. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm gonna wash your car. I didn't even have a car. I was like, I don't even have a car. I'm gonna wash your car? No, I'm not gonna wash your car. She said, okay. But her assignment was, but that was her assignment. Like the assignment part of the assignment was to ask people for things that it was difficult for you to ask them to do. It wasn't about getting someone to do something. It was about confronting your fear of asking for something, even if it was an unreasonable something. And so that's what I'm saying about get in the habit of something you're doing every day. Not like, let's build up our courage for six months and then ask for something, and then if it doesn't go well, we'll ask next year. I'm talking about starting to ask every day specifically people for what you want. Just, just make it like somebody's getting, would you get me a glass of water? Like just little shit like that to just get in the practice of letting go of yearning. Because that's what asking does. It, lets, it diminishes that horrible vibration of yearning. Yearning is not a receptive vibration. Yearning is still the, but I don't really believe I can have it. So asking begins to dissolve the sense of yearning. So if you just get used to that thing of asking, 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 especially, like I said, women of not hinting, not being wishy-washy, not hoping, not wishing, not making a joke of it. Don't make a joke of it when you ask. This is another thing. You'll try to diffuse the asking with humor. Mm -hmm. Don't diffuse the asking with humor. Just ask, kindly ask. Did, you, did, 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 did I mention asking? <laughs> I just want to make sure you really get this, that to know that whatever you want is possible. If it's the healing of some physical condition, if it is financial, if it is about your peace of mind, if it is about an opportunity, whatever it is, to know that it is possible, but you have to ask. All right? Okay, let's do a prayer. I've badgered you enough. 
going to get in my ark and go back to the desert. <laughs> Once again, we close our eyes and take a deep breath. As we come together now again in that oneness, that infinite divine presence that knows only yes, that withholds nothing. It is not a personality, except in the sense that it is infinite personality, not small personality that judges and discerns between deserving and not deserving. It is infinite personality that knows you exactly as you are, that is the source of your aliveness and beingness, that created you by extension as love, that you are not a miserable little speck struggling and striving to try to get your needs met. You are an infinite spirit being. Open yourself up now to let the power flow through as you ask for what you want. Let go of any distinction between what you think of as worthy or unworthy, worldly or spiritual, whether you want peace of mind, serenity, joy, cash, a home, a mate, a friend, more social engagement, more quiet time. Get a clear intention. This is what I choose for myself. This is what I choose for my life. Now relax and let it go. Your part is done. You now relax and let go of how. Release it. Trust principle. Your part now is to keep yourself as joyful and peaceful as possible. To stay in a state of gratitude and appreciation. As together we give thanks for this joining for each and every person here. Again, for vision, for the staff, for the volunteers, for these sacred teachings. We now go out into this glorious day. Of course it's raining. We wanted the rain. How could it be otherwise? When we ask, it is given. This is only the beginning of the greatest part of our lives so far. Greater ease and joy and abundance and health, and vitality, and wisdom, and understanding. Our minds are clear, our hearts are open wide. The source within us is revealing everything just as we need to know it. Only good lies before us. We offer ourselves now to this divine power and presence that it may lead us to our greater good. We offer it our hands and our feet and our voices asking, where would you have us go? What would you have us do and say and to whom? We remember now as always, the way that we will know love and the way that we will feel love is by this perfect love moving through us to the world around us. For this we are thankful and together we all say, amen. You might wanna stretch a little bit. <clears throat> and my new book, Affirmations 101, is in the bookstore. If you don't already have it and you want it, it's 101 days of daily affirmations. It's just one page each. I'm here the third Saturday of every month. 
Go out and have a great weekend. Thanks so much.